like what Irish music means for me is something completely different from what it means to other people because I have my father, I have the Tulla band, I have my own early years in school. Like it means all those things to me. And what does tradition mean? I mean, if tradition is merely the repetition of what something else did, it would be very vacant and empty. And unless it has real life experience for me, it's absolutely pointless. traditional musician. If our traditional music is to survive, it's through people like Martin Hayes. He just pairs the tune down to its, almost sometimes to its bare elements. I think his passion and his romance comes out, and I think that's, uh, that's what grabs people. Now, people are recognizing him and saying, this is the, one of the most exciting players in Ireland. I particularly hear the jazz influence in his tone and his precision. It's not jumping at you. You're sitting back and you're in a trance and it comes across and you hear the beauty of the tune. To me it's a language. To Martin it's a language. It's a language of the emotions. I love his music. He, he gave me great ideas for playing Irish music. listened to the CD and I thought it was sort of scratchy fiddle music and then I came to see him and I I, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what a virtuoso he is. My feet are moving, my hands are clapping, I find myself involved completely physically and mentally in the whole thing. It feels really good, really, really, it touches you in a place that makes you come alive. First time I went to Ireland I found a poor leaf, leaf clover. First time I stepped on Irish soil. You know, this is really, really beautiful playing. It's very gentle, it's very sweet. It's uh, got a lot of character to it. Was there just a fiddle in your house and you, you picked it up? Yeah. Or? Well, there was actually, yeah. My father was a fiddle player. Yeah. And, um, so I've learned from him. In, in the same way that the children learn language, you know, they don't know anything about grammar. They just start talking, you know? Yeah. And they keep going to it. <laughs> and they keep getting corrected and they keep trying to refine it. I think in Clare, music is as important as, as politics or sport or football or hurling. Um, it's as important in some ways as the Catholic Church is. I think to some extent the music is holding its own in terms of the kind of the new globalised MTV culture. It's, you know, it's very much a, a presence in, in world music. Seattle, Clare looks quite different than when I'm in it. When I'm in Clare, Seattle looks quite different, you know? And so I'm, I'm continually referring those two viewpoints against each other, and it's as if, like, they kind of counterbalance each other. Technically, I live in Seattle. My postal address is in Seattle right now. Um, my, my emotional home is probably County Clare, you know? Um, I have an email address which travels cyberspace with me. Every generation wants to play uh, as their mentors would, would say, for instance, Martin would like to play like his father and Paddy Canning, but he can't help it. You have to bring your own influences in. 
because of the music, I, ha I had made friends with people who were 10 times my age. For the most part, I would anxiously await the opportunity to just take my fiddle out instead of dealing with algebra. And in the morning, after I'd have the breakfast, before I got to school, I'd play a couple of tunes because it felt good. And when I was in my early 20s, I, I kind of started to abuse music a bit. Like, I go, well, I, 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 I used it to make money. Um, and I suppose I didn't believe that one could, like, do something, like, emotional and, and touching and deep within your heart and, and expect to exist in the rational world with it. So I, I, I kind of ignored the possibilities of playing, playing what I felt. Martin and I, I, I think, have a a connection that um, musicians don't often get simply that we both went through the same experiences in Chicago of having to play stuff we didn't particularly like. I, I moved to Chicago in 1985 and uh, I rented the first apartment we could get myself into, you know. And uh, it's funny that that apartment was right across the road from Dennis. It, it seemed like any time you'd see him he was doing something different and, and well capable of it. And I keep thinking what a versatile guitarist. Now, if I wonder is there any way if we could get him into traditional music, now what would he do, you know, I mean, what would all, would all his background and all his perspective, like, what would he end up playing? I get asked a lot of questions of, um, well, you're bringing jazz elements in, you're bringing classical elements in, and I honestly don't hear that. I hear a great understanding and an affiliation with Irish traditional music in his playing. He has a whole range of chords he could play, play he could play numerous chord progressions. Whenever I might be consumed in, in emotionalism or something that's not entirely Maybe, maybe entirely rational, not that it has to be all the time, but he evaluates it on terms of music. He's a very good example of somebody quite far removed from the culture who actually understands the expression of the tunes at a very deep level. and like, well, I don't know what that means, or I don't know how to go about it many times, but I know that the music is locked in a part that's, that's larger and deeper than my petty little needs. extraordinary performances I've seen and I felt like he was almost levitating off the stage you know he was like on fire his hair was just all over and he was like rising up but 
I was seeing pictures going way back to an ancient time. I, ha I had this vision like of uh, the bonfire. I feel like I hear my genetic echo through the music. It's the country of my soul. I mean, I've always loved the, the poetry and the literature. The music, it's not about me, really. Like, the music is the feeling that you experience. See, sometimes people like come to hear music and they go, oh, I don't understand it, you know, and maybe there's something I need to know about this and I don't know enough about it yet. And yet, it, left to their own devices, like without trying to analyze it at all, would most likely pick up on the feeling of it. So for me, like, spirituality and music were never, like, well, I didn't see the connection maybe when I was younger, but now for me, they're inseparable. The effort that I would put into music now would not primarily be on the fingerboard of the fiddle or with the bow. It would be in my daily life and, and how I view life and what I would, where, where I would see myself headed as a person. I always consider um, the, the, the actual moment of, of the creation of music to like be the most important part. Like, I mean, live music in a live situation, I always consider more important than recorded music. And would, would, see, would see myself as more of a, a performance artist than a recording artist, for sure. But recording I found useful in that it, it's, it's something to work towards. Um, it's a goal, it's an objective. I'm just going to set it up like I would because I want to record a bit of music with my father. The mini disc is nice because you get random access. It's not quite as, I don't think it's as clean sounding as that. Um, we, we, we set this up all the time like we were traveling. If we're ever in a and b or a hotel for two days, we'll definitely set it up, you know? like great jazz music in some ways. It's, it's, it's improvised on a theme. It's improvised on a pattern which is there already. There's something learned from, uh, from that kind of music, from that kind of jazz in the way that they play. Uh, the way that, for instance, the way they'll, they'll go from one reel into another. What's a reel? Um, a reel is a 4-4 four, four piece of uh, Irish music, which is very, very common. Um, I, I don't know. How can I define it? The reel is a, is a, is a dance in 4-4 four, four, as opposed to jig, which is a piece of music and a dance in 6-8. That's the dance. I was told they were called reels because they're real hard to play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Like one time I liked to play music in a quiet room, locked away quietly. Didn't want anybody to hear. The only real valid experience for me now is when I can genuinely sit there and, and communicate music to somebody else. So performance is kind of an outpouring now. I don't think there's a big difference between playing in different locations because, again, it is the common denominator is the music. It, it's not about a language. It's not about a, um, an environment. It's about the environment created by the music. And we create the same environment wherever we go. Wow. Who would ever imagine they could have gotten the camera in front of them? This is a, a CD of John McLaughlin's. And, uh, I really got into the Indian music as well through McLaughlin. And uh, I started listening to El Shankar, the fiddler, and Ravi Shankar. What else do we have down here? Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. Peter Ostrushko is a great mandolin player from Minneapolis, and that's a gorgeous album. The tune is a very, very complex piece of music. It's called Paddy on the Highway, and it's 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 got as if it's portrayed as if Paddy was playing this accordion while riding on a bicycle across a tightrope. And so there's a, there's an audience going, Ooh, and I mean, in terms of rock and roll, uh, you know, the Beatles are still they'll always be the band, I think. You know, or the Horseflies. To be kind of like as if like a kind of a Pogues version of America old timey. Well, maybe not that even, but it's real, it's something else. It's incredible, it's hypnotic kind of music. stuff I listen to now is more along the lines of uh, like Tommy Potts or uh, Seamus Ennis and, and stuff like that. I, I go through these little missions of, of listening to different players every tour. So it seems like I'm going further and further back in time for some reason. I'll be listening to cylinders at the rate I'm going. I heard music, I suppose, even before I can remember almost. And um, it, it was going on the whole time in the house. People would call here, there'd be house parties, Tully Band would come, my father would play occasionally. So as long as I can remember I'd been hearing music, it seemed like the most normal thing in the world to me, you know. The era of the Cayley Band started around the 40s and 50s with the, we'll say, the start of the Flack Holes, when all the... Um, musicians got together in competition and then you see traditional Irish music up until then was played as a solo music you know there wasn't not many people would play together as a, an ensemble I suppose they were competing with the jazz bands of the time as well at dances and um, they had to have the volume for bigger halls they weren't playing in, in house dances anymore <laughs> to be brought out to the States to play. And that, that was a huge honour, a great honour for, for Claire and for the Tully Cayley band uh, to go out there. And I'm sure the support, I'd love to have been there. It must have been very exciting. Ireland really was a place which was feeling very depressed about itself, uh, whose self-confidence and, and, and sense of worth was probably very low. At that time, Irish culture was absolutely shaped by emigration, and yet, very few other people in the culture were actually recognizing that, uh, were recognizing that there was an Irish audience, uh, that Irishness isn't confined to the island of Ireland. <laughs>
people like Sean O'Reilly, who were very much driving the revival of Irish music in, in the 1960s. Their agenda was really was a kind of European art music agenda, and they wanted Cayley music to be the kind of music where you could have a sort of chamber orchestra playing it, and people would sit back in a theatre and listen to it. Change in anything isn't looked upon, you know, very well, uh, especially with things like traditional music. People like to keep the thing the same, but they, they don't realise that the reason it has survived so long is that it has changed and changed over the years. Like, we don't play like Tarla Carolyn would back centuries ago. Chancy week, it's not, it's not so much that like a student or, or a bystander for the most part will learn a great de deal of detail or specifics, it seems, about the music. You might, you might not, but that's not really the issue. What happens is that after you spend a week there and you meet these people and you hang around, the, the, you're permeated with a sense of what it's about that you couldn't really specify in words, and you're brought into the spirit of the music. Um. Remember I was talking about kind of bending notes a little bit, um, you know, it would have been what would happen in normal vibrato. But I just, we'll, we'll, we'll forget about the vibrato and we'll go. Clancy Week in some ways is a very large carnival. You, you run across all sorts of legendary players that are just wandering the streets and playing just for the sheer fun of playing. It's nice in the central, for instance, uh, P. Joe Hayes and Bobby Casey and, and Junior Crean will sit and play in, a, in one of the back rooms. And, and they're some of the nicest sessions you'll ever hear, the rhythm and the, the, the sort of nice, relaxed way that they play the music to allow it to breathe and, and, uh, and you begin to see exactly where the core of the stuff comes from. quite different to most festivals I would go to in that like there are no staged public performances in the sense of like there are no bands there are no named events there's no big advertising there's no promotion and uh, like whether whether 
whether the chieftains are here or whether a local concertina player out the road are sitting in a pub, it seems to make absolutely no difference. And it's very organic in, in, in the way in which it comes together. So it's very different, you know, from, from festivals that would have like uh, like a high powered lineup of bands and artists, you know, to attract audiences and sell tickets ahead of time. This is all very casual, really. I know when I was a teenager that, that it was an opportunity to do an extraordinary amount of drinking and hear some great music as well. Traveling musicians were the actual travelers themselves, the itinerants or the thinkers of the time, and they were bringing music kind of all over the country. And in some ways, I, I feel like uh, you know, we're kind of more modern day travelers, except like you know, we're, we're traveling by different means, planes and cars and what have you, and we're, we're going much farther afield. Like, I'd be bringing an aspect of East Clare music all the way maybe to San Francisco and down to Sydney. And well, I mean, basically, what we do is we travel, live off our music. And, and, you know, share it and express it and teach it, you know? So we all meet each other all the time, uh, like ships passing in the night. And there's something really nice about that, you know? You, you kind of, you meet and you have a drink and you say, well, time, I have to go and get my plane now. One night in uh, Seattle, like it was, I had just come back from Ireland and all of a sudden I had this impulse, I must go down and visit my brother Pat, you know, which meant I thought I was sitting in my house back in Clare, and I was gonna walk down the avenue and visit my brother. I actually thought that for a second, you know, and then I realized, you know, you're actually about 7,000 miles away from his house right now. And it, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know. Where 
home here, you know, there, there's been competition, not competition, but so many of, of us were such a small community. I mean, we couldn't earn a living here just playing in Ireland and uh, unless we wanted to play in bars and pubs and slugs. And if he was based in Ireland, he'd tour Ireland maybe once a year, you know, and then in America, uh, the population's so big, you can tour continuously. It is amazing everywhere we go there is Irish music and there's an Irish pub and there are Irish players. But I'm, I'm beginning to think that there might actually be more people playing traditional music in the United States than there is in Ireland. I think the, the point is that maybe Irish music just doesn't dwell in this island entirely anymore, you know. Or just, it doesn't necessarily dwell inside the world of Irish people. There are sessions of music in Moscow. There are sessions of music in Japan, in Tokyo. There's music in North Dakota and South Dakota, all over the world. And they're playing traditional music. They're playing it because they like it. And it's music that they do. and uh, he found bootleg tapes of a tape he did with his dad, you know, in, in Alaska. And they only made 500 tapes and he's finding them in Alaska, you know. So it's, it, it's definitely a, a world music at this point. Ireland's becoming the end place at the moment. Like everywhere that I travel, for instance, I was in Japan recently and uh, the Japanese just want to know everything Irish. And not alone the music, but the culture, the artists, the writers. Hi. I'm a music teacher. I've been teaching in university, yes. Uh, and then I, I also teach Irish music. Uh, I teach Japanese folk music as well, yes. But Japanese folk music is not popular. Uh, almost no Japanese, pe Japanese people know about our own traditional music. It's a pity. I wrote a book about Irish music in Japanese. And then I wrote about Martin Hayes and also Tal Kelly Band. And the 7,000 copies were sold out already, so I'm very happy. Some people might say his music is not traditional, but I don't think so. His music is based on real, authentic, traditional, especially in, in East Korea. Generally, Irish people abroad, if they, if they never particularly listened to Irish music at home, um, might find the whole thing quite exciting, that now the, the kind of world is accepting this and kind of hailing it as a particular art form. A lot of people you meet, recent immigrants, will say, I, I never listened to Irish music until I came to the States. So 
So obviously they, they regard it as a link with what they've left. They've been forced to move around a lot. They've been forced to cope with different kinds of circumstances. Uh, and they've been forced to adapt in order to survive. Uh, and I think that's exactly what the music does, and it's why it has that kind of place in the Irish psyche. Petty Fahey wrote all these tunes and just called them Petty Fahey's. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so this doesn't mean anything, I'm just telling you this. And, uh, but it was written by uh, this fiddle player from Galway, and uh, it's a long, long way from Galway to here, so we thought you might be interested. <laughs> country to be based in. I feel because there is such an amalgamation of cultures there. I like to live in a place where if, if you try, if you have an idea and you want to try something, nine out of ten people say, give it a go. In Scotland, nine out of ten people say, it'll no work. into whatever you could potentially be and the complete freedom to do so. I don't think there's any piece of land in America that I could ever really own or feel like that's me. Like, I don't think if I lived there all of my life till I was 90, I don't think I'd have that feeling like of, of the land so much as, as, as I do here, you know. I feel this, this spot here is me, it's my family, it's my past. Are you all set there? The Fatal Festival was put together, I think, you know, without a, a big like objective in mind you know and it was just basically to celebrate the area and to celebrate the music locally and to just bring in musicians it was a matter of local pride and above all festivals i think in its genesis it's it's about celebrating the area which is like just about two hours, I think, probably north of San Francisco. Uh, this is a Celtic festival, but it, it's also kind of, I suppose, a community festival here. And there's, you get a kind of convergence of, of people with kind of different interests. There's a lot of, of people here who have a, a, a Scottish cultural interest, people who have an Irish cultural interest, people who are kind of into folk music, people who are into uh, Renaissance music and into what have you. You know, there's, there's, there's a kind of a convergence of people with those varied interests gathering here, you know. Uh, 
you know, we're all Celts. All Celtic music would include Irish music, but not all Irish music would include Celtic music. Maybe I lump it all together, but as I listen to more of it, I think I'm, I'm learning the distinctions between it. It's not the kind of music I hear on the radio or here on MTV or something. This is, this is down to the root, this type of music. Like I find the people are very open to the experience. Like that, that, that they've, they've come with an open mind. It feels like in an open heart. They're, they're not here to, to pass judgment. They're here to experience it. You know. If all these people are communicating so much, then there's bound to be a kind of a, a coming together of ideas, which means a loss of the original. You know, the, the beautiful little thing that only ever happens in this backwoods wee place. The, the regional style seems to, seem to be kind of evening out a bit. I mean, maybe it's because a lot of people are learning from records and stuff like that, I don't know. Well, Donegal style is um, characteristic of being energetic, um, sometimes maybe aggressive and uh, robust, while uh, Mar Martin's completely different to all of that. They're very strict in how they play, and you know, they were influenced a lot by Michael Coleman and James Morrison and the Sligo style, and you can hear that all over the States. And it's a great, it's another, we'll say, type of music now within the Irish framework of traditional music. I would definitely, in, in Clare, think that the music, you know, plays a very, very important part in the, in, in rural life, in their life, and uh, I suppose the old politics can sort of take second place. I would have thought, uh, you know, the music is it's just it's a necessity to life. I think for a long time. The traditional music scene was seen as being almost exclusively aligned with an Irish nationalist identity. It was seen as being a kind of political and, and social statement and, and of being relatively conservative. Uh, I think that has begun to change and, and, and has changed quite substantially. Even if you don't think of yourself as a, as a nationalist, you'll probably have some degree of national pride. But if it really acts as, as, as a single identifying force it's too narrow a perspective for the music because the music is about much more than political identity or national identity traditional music it's tended to do it in a way which takes the music out of its context and, and puts it into a studio and then tries to pretend that this is as if you're sitting in a public county fair Doing 
television shows is, is just, it's part of the business of, of music, but it's very difficult to put meaningful visuals. Uh, you know, I mean, we've had the usual landscapes and the Celtic crosses and all that, like, but how much of that can you actually watch, like, in the sea? You know, I mean, every tune can have a lake and a mountain behind it, and then there's just so many visuals you can have of a fiddle and a guitar happening. A symphony on television will have nothing compared to the power of the live performance ever, you know, it just never will. change everything to make it radio, MTV, TV friendly, you know, because it, it really goes against the, the very nature of it, I think. of our traditional music is its relationship to a community and an audience. It's, it's about what these people are playing now at this moment for the people who are around them. And once you begin to take it out of that context and, and create it as a very self-conscious image of Ireland, then you run a huge danger, actually, that it becomes a kind of parody of itself. It's never been as fashionable. It's, you know, it's very much a, a presence in, in world music. It has also become very much part of a tourist industry. It's become part of a very self-conscious idea of what it is to be Irish. Uh, and it's in huge danger of being packaged out of existence. Like, I, I think we're more consumerist and self-centered now, you see. So we have different values. And these values really are at odds with what you're trying to get at in this music. And I know that I personally struggle with this. And a lot of times, you know, I don't get there. And a lot of times I do, and I, I, you know, you just keep struggling with it. Like for me to get to the essence of music, I, I more, I more often spend time talking about it than achieving it, and um, and and hoping for it. And um, it's when I finally accept that I've completely missed the point, and that I can don't really get it, that I have this moment when I get it. Which, of course, I want to put my arms around it, I want to put it in a bottle, I want to grab it, I want to keep it, I want to store it, I love it, and I can't. And I have to let go of it again. And uh, so it's an ongoing battle, just to be in the space where that makes musical sense. And, and just trying to keep some composure in, in the face of, you know, like making records, touring, doing documentaries, which are just like at odds with what music really is in some ways but you know nonetheless it's it's part of the larger picture of what i try to do